Okay, Tom, you're just cherry picking things right now. This is not really the way it is. I mean, I've got a farm. Uh, I've got insects attacking my crops. Uh, this is what I want to focus on. So, you know, don't give me your old cockroach Drosophila melanogaster thing. I need you to focus more on the plants. And I would say nothing has changed. My thesis is still valid. The insects are only going after uh, unfit nutritionally poor, dead or dying plants, as well as some of the foods that I just mentioned. So in order to hit home my point, and I, and I need to appeal to reason in this, here's a picture I took uh, when I was in uh, Hawaii, a place I'd love to be back in right now. But in the tropical rainforest, uh, we've got a lot of vegetation. It doesn't matter whether it's in uh, South America, tropical rainforest, whether you're in Hawaii, there is a massive amount of vegetation. And if you go out there, and I have, you can find a lot of insects. So I ask you, rhetorical question, why haven't the insects decimated the tropical rainforest? Why haven't they eaten all of it? What is actually preventing them within a season, two seasons at most, of completely destroying and eating every single vegetative leaf in the tropical rainforest, but they haven't. Because if you go to the tropical rainforest, doesn't matter whether it's Hawaii or anywhere else, most of the plants are growing very, very well. And there's very few insects feeding on them. There are some insects uh, feeding on some, but mostly they're not. Why is that? And, I, and I'm telling you, it's because they are very, very selective. They're only going after certain plants that they wish to eat and they're gonna be passing up other plants that they don't want to touch. So we've got some beautiful plants in Hawaii, the tropical rainforests remain virtually untouched and that's part of the reason. So this then begs the question, what does constitute a healthy plant? How do you know that a plant is healthy? Well, I've, I've let you know already that there is one indicator already, and that's the insect. If the insect is, atta uh, is attacking your plant, you've got some idea that it is unhealthy. But if you don't have those indicators, let's say you're spraying insecticides and you're killing the insects, so you're not able to use them as indicators, how do you tell? Can any of you tell as you're looking at this plant right now, just by eyeballing it, is it healthy or not? And for those of you who say it's healthy, I would say why scientifically can you explain to me scientifically why that plant is healthy and for those of you who think it's unhealthy I would ask you too why why is this plant unhealthy can you explain to me why it is and so this gets to the point now where you realize okay there needs to be some way in order for me to determine whether a plant is unhealthy or not. That's gotta be a good starting point, uh, especially if we don't have the insects in order to, uh, to tell us. And it would be good if we could scientifically show that uh, for, uh, uh, for, for what we uh, wanna do, which in my presentation is to make the point in slide number two. Insect resistance, serious insect resistance begins in this eight to 12 range. Um, that's important to know too, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that in just a second. And by the time you get to 12 and above, uh, things are objectively healthy. The plant is objectively healthy. There is, there is no other indication, and no matter how you test it, you will find that there are healthy components all over it. This is where the cutoff comes from. So when you re, uh, take a look at the internet, you see the number 12, and this is kind of what it's alluding to. I prefer things to be at 14 or higher because it's a little bit safer. There's gonna be some fluctuations in bricks and the plants. So 14 is a little bit safer than 12, but this kind of gives you an idea that they are objectively healthy. And when they are there, you know, food is now produced. It is now fit for human consumption. When I say fit for human consumption, it means something that you can eat and that will contribute to longevity. In other words, long-term health. You will have no insects and you will have no disease on any of these plants. And these plants are relatively rare in our uh, landscape uh, right now. Not in our landscape, I shouldn't say that, but uh, mostly on many of the farms, uh, sadly. Soybean aphid. This is something uh, you're familiar with if you have dealt with soybeans before. About 92% of the uh, soybeans in this country, uh, maybe a little bit higher now, um, uh, are now GMO. 
Uh, they were introduced in the United States in 1996. Uh, the soybean aphid was first discovered in the U.S. and you cannot see it right now because it's off the screen, I think, at least it isn't on my screen, uh, was discovered in 1999. This does not mean the soybean aphid uh, resurrected or suddenly became uh, an entity before that. It was always present, but it had to wait until the soybean's health went down to the point where it could actually start eating it. So aphis glycinus came in in 1999, but it took, uh, I believe, uh, the GMO soybean in order to actually select for this particular uh, pest. And so this now brings me to um, uh, the last slide here. And in this last slide, what I want to do, I've now superimposed uh, some groups of insects on this so that you can get a better idea of what BRICS levels uh, these insects prefer to be on a plant. These are not BRICS levels where they're on the plant. These are BRICS levels when they lose interest in the plant. The grasshoppers, they're the toughest I have found. Grasshoppers uh, will take a bite out of your plant even if it's a 12. So by the time you get to 10 to 12 bricks, grasshoppers, katydids, crickets, they lose interest in the plant. Uh, the plant is too healthy, it's too difficult to chew, it's too difficult to eat, it's indigestible, and they're gonna start to lose interest by the time you get to 10 to 12. Uh, once you get too low, they also lose interest because they need a certain level of health in order to survive, and grasshoppers are definitely the highest group I have found among the insects. The next lowest group, the chewing insects, they will leave a plant once that plant gets to between 9 to 11 based upon the chewing insect, whether it's chewing on your roots, whether it's chewing on the stem, whether it's chewing on a flower, chewing on the leaf, it doesn't matter. These chewing insects are able to tolerate a relatively high bricks, but they lose interest by, by about 9 to 11. And so if you don't have any chewing insects on your plant, uh, that kind of gives you an idea of what bricks you're dealing with because you're gonna be dealing with something which is absolutely below 11 if it's a basic chewing insect and possibly, probably below nine. The next group, the sucking insects. The sucking insects will lose interest in a plant between seven to nine bricks. Not that they're found on the plant at that point, uh, but they're always on a plant that's not uh, below nine bricks. Oftentimes uh, they'll be below seven and uh, so if you've got leaf hoppers, uh, some of the bugs, uh, the pentatomids, uh, stink bugs attacking your plant, uh, that means you have not reached seven, eight or nine bricks. And it adjusts a little bit based upon the insect, but that gives you a general overview as to where we are uh, with uh, the sucking insects. And the last group I want to differentiate because they're the lowest. The aphid group includes not only all the aphids, we've got several thousand species of aphids out there, it includes the scale insects as well, also a homopterous insect. They will lose interest on a plant when it's between six to eight. And this is why I alluded to the fact is that if you get a dosage of sugar, if you can health up a plant, you can actually kill an aphid uh, relatively quickly, again, less than a minute. And so this aphid group, which I'm including scale insects and a few others, will lose interest at six to eight. So it's really common. When I see aphids, I immediately know I'm probably dealing with a three to six bricks plant because generally speaking, that's what I find uh, when I'm getting to that. In the case of the chewing insects, someone might even ask the question, well, what happens if they're in the middle of feeding? What are they gonna do? It's, it's a good valid question to have. So if you have a pecan tree in Georgia or uh, Northern Florida here, and a fall webworm uh, is interested in it, she will come lay her eggs and they will lay their eggs, the caterpillars will come out and they'll start eating the plant because it's considered to be uh, edible uh, to the fall webworm. If the plant uh, is able to produce enough plant secondary metabolites and uh, get its bricks level up, uh, they will lose interest in the plant and all of the fall webworms will collect in a clump at the end of the branch. They will be mere inches uh, away from a healthy pecan leaf and they will remain there for several days. Over the course of several days, they will starve to death and one by one, they will start falling off of the tree. So yes, it can happen in the middle of feeding to the point where the fall webworm was even unable to continue its development. Uh, so, so that should kind of give you an idea of how sensitive 
the insects are. And by taking a look at this chart, this gives you at least a brief overview and introductory uh, comments about uh, what insects attack at what, um, at what levels. Wipe this meme from the face of the earth.